Uh, so welcome everyone and thank you for joining us in our SPACs in Space Roundtable. I'm Tess Hatch, a partner at Bessemer Venture Partners. And in March earlier this year, Rocket Lab, Spire, and Velo all announced their SPAC mergers with Vector, NavSite, and JAWS Spitfire respectively. So we thought it an opportune time to get the gang together to discuss all things SPACs in space and the future of the space industry at large. So I'm sure you've all uh, heard that you can't spell space without SPAC. Today, we are delighted to bring together all of our space CEOs, Pete Beck from Rocket Lab, Peter Platzer from Spire, Benny Buller from Velo 3D, and Lori Garver from Earthrise Alliance. I'm gonna hand it over to my partner at Bessemer, David Cowan, to introduce all of our esteemed panelists. Hi, I'm David Cowan, Tessa's partner at Bessemer. And, um, you know, conventional wisdom says you shouldn't develop a technology in search of a problem. And yet, uh, Pete Beck has done exactly this his whole life. <clears throat> He's been enamored by rockets. His first application was to rocket power a bicycle. Um, he then decided that if we could have RPGs, rocket propelled grenades, why not have rocket propelled cameras and rocket propelled radios? And so he built those for DARPA. Um, and then he uh, set his sights on delivering CubeSats to low Earth orbit. Uh, he and his team developed the first electric powered uh, rocket turbine um, and, they, and he, they built out the first privately owned space launch range uh, and they achieved the first commercial delivery of a, uh, you know, from a small payload rocket. They've had 18 successful missions at Rocket Lab and uh, the next applications for rocketry will be to send craft to the moon, to Venus, to Mars and uh, Pete's team has cooked up a new program that will even accommodate human flight. So uh, we're excited to have Pete back from Rocket Lab with us today. Pete is the one who told me about our next entrepreneur, Benny Buller. And uh, Pete said, gee, 3D, you know, 3D metal printing is the key to rocketry. And the holy grail of this technology is being developed by this little startup in Santa Clara. And he introduced us to Velo 3D. Now, the founder, Benny Buller, had been frustrated with the limitations of 3D metal printing, specifically the requirement to modify parts to accommodate the printer before you can print them. And he thought this is ridiculous, and he, and he resolved to fix it without having any idea how to do it. And I can tell you that during the sort of darkest phase of development, when uh, I, like, I don't think he had any idea how, it was, how we were actually going to do it, I asked him his confidence interval. I said, Benny, how likely is it that you're actually going to figure out how to make a 3D metal printer without supports that can print any part. And he looked at me without missing a beat and he said 100%. And in fact, uh, Velo 3D has in fact cracked the code on 3D metal printing and they can now print virtually any part and the, three, and the Velo 3D printer has quickly become the printer of choice for the new generation of rocket engines. So, um, uh, like Benny, we have another unlikely space entrepreneur and that's Peter Platzer. Uh, Peter is a physicist, and he had worked at CERN, and then he worked in algorithmic trading on Wall Street, uh, but he attended a Singularity University program and had this epiphany that now's the time to harvest, harness the power of microsat constellations in space with a software-based approach that accommodates multiple sensors and uploadable applications on each of his tiny, tiny toaster-sized satellites. Uh, so Peter first pitched this startup to us when it was called NanoSatisfy. Nano satisfy, right. And his ambition at the time seemed as wild and unlikely as all the other startups who were pitching us. Um, and so we passed. But then he came back a year later and actually had four satellites on orbit and customer contracts. And we thought, wow, this guy's actually making things happen. So we invested. And since then, Spire Global, as the company is now called, has deployed over 100 of these lemur satellites, making it the most populous multi-purpose constellation in the galaxy, as far as we know. So these companies all have a few things in common. Um, during our due diligence on these companies, we were told by experts that all three of these companies were doing something that was impossible, and it was ridiculous for us to invest in them. Uh, you, can, you can read more about our decisions to invest in the original investment memos that Bestromer wrote for each of these three companies, which we are declassifying and publishing at bvp.com slash memos today. Uh, and so um, it's always a fun blast from the past when we look back and try to, try to remember what it is that we thought about these companies when we first invested. 
Uh, another thing in common is that all three companies were doing something very hard and discovered that they really had to build their own supply chains. That the, that the parts that they thought they could get off the shelf just didn't do the job for the missions that they had and each of them had to vertically integrate. And then finally, third thing they have in common is that they all decided to, uh, to do SPAC mergers in order to accelerate uh, the missions of their businesses. And that's what we're here to talk about today. All of the CEOs, as you've heard from David, today are incredibly impressive. And uh, it's my honor to introduce our fourth CEO, Lori Garver, that we're especially excited to share and welcome that Lori is joining Bessemer as an executive in residence. Before Earthrise, where she is the CEO of today, Lori served as the Deputy Administrator of NASA under President Obama. And she also founded the Brooke Owens Fellowship which provides summer internships for college undergraduate women planning to pursue aviation or space careers, helping them travel down the path that she paved. And both Rocket Lab and Spire have hosted Brookies, which they call themselves for summer internships. So we'd like to welcome Lori and jump right into today's discussion, where we're gonna discuss a variety of topics from space junk to space rockets. And thank you to the audience. A lot of you guys have submitted great questions. So we'll be weaving those into the discussion. Um, and in the meantime, all of the participants, feel free to submit a question via the Zoom chat. I'm seeing a handful of those um, already populate. So we'll be asking those along the way. Jumping right in. David, why are SPACs so hot right now for space companies? You mentioned a thing that all of our space companies have in common is they all announced these SPAC mergers a few months ago. So, so why now? Why space? Why SPAC? Well, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that space in the last few years has really captured the imagination of the public in a way that it hasn't perhaps even since the Apollo program. And it has to do with just the acceleration of milestones of, in space colonization from, uh, you know, uh, the, from plans to colonize Mars, discoveries of potentially of life in the, in the atmosphere of Venus, um, the Japanese uh, expedition to an asteroid for the first time, uh, Na NASA's Artemis plan to put a woman on the moon and, and uh, resume development of a lunar base, uh, you know, SpaceX's successful uh, ferrying of astronauts um, and deployment of an internet in outer space like through Starlink that can reach every corner of the planet. I mean, this has all been happening at, a, at an accelerated pace. At the same time, that the stock market is trading at all-time highs and interest rates are, are at all-time lows. And so if you're looking for a place to invest your money that's high growth, a lot of investors are looking towards, towards private companies that still have a lot of growth ahead of them. And so you combine that, that interest in, in uh, spacking early stage high growth companies with the promise of space colonization, and naturally we're seeing a lot of space companies uh, coming to the SPAC market. Awesome, thanks. And and specs aren't new, Peter. They've been around as a way to go public for a while. Why did you specifically spac instead of go public? Uh, one of the other ways. Yeah, I think I think that's an excellent question, Tess. I mean, so uh, uh, we have been on this route to go public for about eighteen months. You know, we had uh, presented to the board and approved an, an IPO uh, pathway. Because the customers that we sell to, you know, large corporations, global corporations, and governments, you know, they they prefer to work with something which is a little bit more, you know, trust inspiring to them, and that's exactly what 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 a public company gives you, and so for us that kind of like was that was that was the next step, and so we um, uh, interviewed with a number of uh, of stock exchanges, we talked with bankers, and went down that path when specs became just a, just a little bit more credible. And I think what that what then uh, convinced us to include it was a the increased quality of operators um, that come when you when, when you do a spec. And the other one is I understood the place in the marketplace. Like if you think about it over the last 20 years or so, the public investors started to be locked out of the value creation from, let's say, a market cap of one billion to 10 billion. Right. Traditionally, in the early in the late 90s and 2000s, that was where the public investor could actually participate. But lately, that had not been possible anymore. And the public investors was pushed to only 
being able to, to participate in the value creation from like 10 billion to 100 billion. And I think what this SPAC route allows is it gives the public investor access again to the value creation from say, you know, 1 billion to 10 billion. And so we added it to our mix and then ended up finding just a really, really high value partner in, in Bob and Jack that added an enormous amount of network and operational experience to us as a company. And it became the, um, uh, the natural choice to execute on that long-term plan we had for a while. So, so private funded, public funded, those are of course ways that companies can be backed, but space specifically has a lot of billionaire funded companies. Pete, what is it like competing against whether it's Bezos or Richard or Elon, these space backed companies from billionaires? Yeah, I think, I think for us, it, it certainly sharpens the focus, um, you know, being a being kind of initially a venture backed company, you, you can't afford to, you know, to make the same mistakes and run down the, the same roads. And if you look at, um, you know, there are some examples you mentioned there where the amount of capital that has gone in versus um, kind of the, you know, the successful milestones achieved is, is really quite disproportionate. Um, and I think there's, there's nothing like the existential, you know, threat of death to, to get stuff done. Uh, and having too much money is is actually, uh, I believe, a bad thing. And you know, I, I sit on the board of a number of startups down here in New Zealand, and um, and you know, some that have raised you know reasonable significant amounts of capital. And 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 those companies are probably less successful than the ones that 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 are always hungry and and really can't afford to make those mistakes. So um, so I think for us, it's, it's it's a real advantage. I mean, we've been able to achieve the things we've been able to achieve because um, we have no option but but having to, um, it's, it's you, you achieve or, or die. So when, when you have the, the kind of the cushion of, um, uh, you know, everlasting funds, then um, th there's not the, the same impetus to just get things done. And, and Pete, I'd, I'd love uh, your thoughts on this. You've announced a product roadmap of getting something done, which is building a larger rocket that will take people to space. And, and Lori, I'd love to hear your answer on this too. Does it really help the Earth to have humans go to space? Yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, what, you know the, the, the Neutron product for us is, is really about covering a wide spectrum of opportunities. Um, you know, it's a, a mega constellation uh, launcher, probably first. And then um, if, you, if you're building a launch vehicle that can you know, carry eight tons to orbit or more, then um, you may as well build one that can can also uh, you know serve that role of of carrying humans um, in, 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 into orbit. So um, for us, uh, you know, it's 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 very much um, if you're going to develop that kind of capability, um, do it do it from the beginning and and, and do it right. But um, Laurie Laura can probably answer the question far more uh, far more eloquently than me. But I mean, I think there there is there's something about the human race that that we we all always want to explore. Um, it's it's kind of hard coded. Uh, genetically that that as a species we, we always want to go further and explore all the things around us so I think uh, space exploration is, is just kind of the natural thing for us to do as a species. Sure um, I think that's very eloquent the, the going into space has of course in so many ways given us knowledge of the planet that we would never have otherwise it is immeasurable the benefits to Earth from going into space. And that includes humans going into space. Because, you know, we did have pictures of Earth from space uh, before Apollo 8, but nobody cares about it because a person didn't take the picture. Um, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, and, and I think, as, as Pete just said, so we talk about this innate um, need to explore that uh, life life um, has to explore to survive. So over the long term, I think uh, space exploration is critical to the, the health of the planet and society. Of course, that's a really long term thing and we have to do everything we can with our space program to help assure that Earth is around and humanity is around long enough to do that. And I think lots of these um, companies are helping on that end too. Uh, when when people go to space, others are more interested and others can aspire to uh, a, a better future. There's a lot of things that we talk about, both the head and the heart for why humans 
go to space. And I think they both do benefit us here on Earth. So, Lori, what do you think is or are the biggest opportunities in the next three to five years? Maybe you can make that 10. You pick your, your time for space, maybe other than humans, of course. So assuming that's uh, commercial space opportunities, I do think the markets have really, as David outlined, matured. Keep in mind, I have been doing this since the 1980s and Gerard O'Neill, who uh, inspired you know, Jeff Bezos, um, was talking about moving off the planet. And of course we had science fiction writers, Arthur C. Clarke, who, pioneered ultimately communication. So the unique perspective of space should be utilized to its fullest uh, to expand government, military, commercial markets. And to me, we've been doing that and will continue in the communications, positioning, um, imaging, any type of scientific exploration will continue and I think beyond sort of those terrestrial benefits um, is supporting what it is the government wants to do as we go further. And I think that is, in Artemis's case, gotten to a point that's more serious than we have since probably Apollo. I know there isn't that much more money yet, but I do sense there's this alignment and also the reduced cost of being able to operate in space allows the government to do more. And hopefully policymakers around the world um, are seeing this because it isn't just a U.S. phenomenon, uh, obviously at all. And uh, I think the opportunities over the next few years are to expand on the technologies we already have and improve them. And I think the markets that will be opened are only limited now because accessibility is uh, so much better um, by people's ideas, and that is unlimited. One of those technical opportunities that we should expand upon um, and, and that Fana asked in the chat is regarding 3D printing, printing of, of, of space parts. So, so Benny, maybe you could help answer this one. Um, how realistic is it to print parts in space? And then a step from that is like, how far are we from printing on the moon? Like having 3D printers on the moon so, so we can print a piece up there rather than send it up there. So I think it's actually much more easy, much easier and much more tangible to print on the moon or for that matter on any other solid ground than it is in space. I also think it's uh, more uh, commercially necessary. So if you think about a uh, moving in space as analogous to moving on the ocean in previous centuries. Um, to this date, we are not manufacturing on uh, oil rigs in the ocean, right? We are not uh, manufacturing on ships in transit. But as people colonize and as, as civilization expands across continent, we brought our manufacturing technologies to the, to the new world. So I think um, there will be a lot of sense to bring our manufacturing technologies on bases that we're going to put on planet on, on different planets and on the moon. Uh, I think the uh, impetus to uh, manufacture in space itself in, in orbit uh, is actually becoming weaker and weaker as we are making leaps and bounds in, uh, in launch technology and reducing the cost of launch and making launch more accessible and more frequent. I, and uh, I think uh, the whole idea about manufacturing in space is driven by it's so expensive to get there, or it gets less and less expensive to get there and more accessible and easier. As, as Pete is get, going to get rockets every week or maybe every few days. And that, I think this drive will become much, much weaker. So digging into these opportunities, the lunar opportunities, um, whether it's Benny 3D printing on the moon, um, what are other ones, Pete? What are, you're, you're going to the moon. Like what are other lunar opportunities ahead of us? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think the, the, the exploration one is, is clearly, you know, the, the prime at the moment. Um, we have to explore to, to understand what resources there are to, that, that can be useful. Um, so 
I think I think that that's kind of the prime directive right now is is to um, is to explore and and you know we, we're lucky to to play an important um, but small role in in that very first part of that um, program. But um, you know to, to to Benny's point, I think um, you know manufacturing and, and being able to manufacture on um, on any of these kind of services is going to be is, is going to be key to sustain and, and grow. And then what about Digging into other opportunities, um, Peter and, and and maybe David. I mean, Peter has a multi-purpose constellation in Leo, and David, we get many pitches of sensors on constellations. What future applications do we have there? I mean, Earth observation and communications. There's lots playing in those buckets. What, what are other ones? Is there more room in those two? What are you guys seeing in the operator section of the space stack? Well, I, so I can talk to the startups that are coming in and pitching Bessemer. Um, when you talk about Earth observation, it's more than just taking pictures, visual pictures. There's all other kinds of Earth observation that, that you can do, like Spire does. Um, you can listen, you can look at multispectral or hyperspectral, you can look at SAR through clouds and at night. Um, you can tune your frequencies to find specific things like a methane leak on the planet. Um, so there are all sorts of very interesting applications. You can, you know, you can tune it to understand how healthy your crops are. Um, lots of lots of applications there. And then communications also. It's more than you know what we think of as satellite television. Um, there's there's all kinds of ways of using satellites, like we see now what SpaceX is doing with Starlink to extend the internet. But um, when we think about, but I think another interesting application of constellations will be to connect to all of the IoT devices that are out there. So increasingly radios are being inserted into all kinds of, you know, anything from a vending machine to a sensor within a, within a, a field, uh, crops. And you can't expect that there's always going to be a robust LTE connection uh, for talking to those radios, but you can deploy satellites with very low bandwidth radios who can ping these little IoT devices all over the planet. And so, um, so I, I think it's inevitable that that's another application of these constellations. So, uh, and then beyond, um, beyond Earth observation and communications, we see a lot of other applications coming up there. You know, certainly we know GPS is, is a very robust one and that's gonna be overhauled with more secure and precise generations. Um, and, uh, and even interesting applications like triangulating one's location on Earth in a secure way which, you know, so you can actually prove where you are. Think about logging into a, into a database or a resource for your corporation, and they actually know that you're in, that you're somewhere where you're supposed to be when you do it. That, you know, we see all kinds of interesting applications there too. Um, I, I, I'm always reminded of like a conference that I attended in the, in the late eighties on personal computers, you know, like those were the days when the personal computers were still a bit sketchy and, you know, IBM said there's a global world market of like three computers and, uh, uh, you know, the poor person, you know, which in this case is me and David, were asked, you know, what's the, what's the killer application for the personal computer, which is has no power and is like so slow and everything, right? Um, um, and, and the panelist was sweating and then he said, you know, I, I think the killer application is going to be housewives using them for their recipes. And that's why we're going to need a computer in every home, right? Um, uh, and of course, now this is kind of like a, a really, really bad joke. And so I always feel like I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to say something uh, which is going to become the, you know, housewives needing it for the recipes. Because quite honestly, um, if you think about what happened with the, with the transition from, from mainframes to personal computers and the internet, um, no one thought of like the killer application being, you know, Instagram and, uh, and WhatsApp and Uber and Airbnb as the killer applications of this technology. And so I honestly don't think that, um, uh, 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 and, and hopefully David don't take this the wrong way, I don't think that we in this room actually know what is gonna be some of the biggest application of leveraging the high ground, the highest ground, space, to solve problems on Earth. But um, uh, nonetheless, I'm gonna step now in kind of like that, um, uh, that little uh, problem and say, you know, some of the things that I'm uh, excited about is, uh, is kind of like um, turning those satellites the other way around. 
right? And making them like a giant telescope. Like if you think about like this, um, uh, the, the, the very large um, uh, radar array, right? Um, uh, that is built and we build them on the ground, right? Or think of an optics array where you can do interpolation and you just build like a giant ring around the earth and make it like this giant telescope that is looking outwards, um, uh, both from a, from, a, from a planetary defense perspective to see, you know, other kind of, any, any kind of near earth objects that are coming our way, uh, but also from kind of like exploring the universe perspective, which now can be done, it's just like orders of magnitude lower cost and faster. I think other ideas which, uh, which, which could be very interesting is um, uh, to use them for, for compute power. Like if you think about a data center or cloud computing, the vast majority of the power that we pump into it, generated by massive amounts of carbon dioxide, probably on some other place on earth, actually goes away into heat. And we spend more carbon dioxide to get rid of this heat with, uh, with air conditioning. Well, guess what? Space is actually pretty freaking cold. So, I mean, I think uh, uh, maybe there is a way to leverage that natural coldness of space by saying, you know what, we can get it up there very, very cheaply. Um, we have massive communication bandwidth. So let's leverage the, the, the freezing cold of space to massively reduce the amount of, uh, uh, of costs that we have for running those compute cycles. And, you know, you might be surprised to hear that we have been approached by some people people, um, they generally come from like the Bitcoin persuasion, um, uh, where power is a bit problems. So it's like, hey, you know, can we, can we mine some Bitcoins in space using, using the coldness there, right? Um, uh, so I think, I think we have not come up uh, uh, as humanity um, with the most impactful applications, but I see that the uh, uh, same way as the transition from mainframes to personal to the internet drove massive innovation that impacted almost every single industry on earth the same way is going to happen with space, which you know, is exactly what Morgan Stanley in one of the latest notes said, that you know, almost every industry is going to be impacted and or disrupted by, by space and what we can do from the ultimate high ground. So Peter and Pete, let's say we launch this, this uh, data infrastructure constellation, we launch the telescope constellation, we're gonna launch more Earth observation and more communication constellations. Like, it's getting pretty crowded up there. Like that sounds like a lot of assets in space. And when an asset dies, it becomes trash or drunk. I mean, we have a question in the audience from Nitin regarding like whether and how to deal with space junk. What do you, what do the Peters think? Well, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from my perspective and then throw it over to you. But, um, you know, I guess this is something that, that within Rocket Lab, at least, you know, we, we, we're very vocal about and vocal in, the, in terms of actually the need for, for international cooperation and regulation on this, on this matter. Um, you know, it, 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 space is big, let, 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 that, that's a fact. Um, but the, you know, the relative velocities between things are also big. So, um, and, and space is one of those, one of those things where it's, you know, it's not like air traffic where you can just divert over a country because you know they don't want you flying over the air traffic. Like you, you are going on that trajectory, and there is nothing stopping that. Um, it's physics. So, uh, you know, then an international collaboration and cooperation in a in a basic set of of, of ground rules, I think, is ultimately going to be needing. Well, it does now it needs 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 to be established now. And um, you know, the the rise of the mega constellation. Um, I see, you know, China's just announced a, a, a large communication mega constellation program. Um, so quickly we go from having tens of thousands of, of objects in orbit into hundreds of thousands or even millions of objects in orbit. So um, th there's going to need to be um, international agreement on this. And uh, we, we spoke at the UN on this, on this very, very point. And um, it was incredibly inspiring and incredibly depressing, um, incredibly inspiring in the fact that a whole bunch of people from all different countries turned up to have a conversation about it. Some some countries that don't like each other, uh, but the depressing in the fact that you know when when you look at what was actually you know the last thing that was internationally agreed by everyone was like 1972. So there's there's a there's a lot of work to go here. Um, you know as as you know as, as all of us in in you know the nations of the planet to actually agree on some infrastructure and some ground rules here. Uh, and you know propagate those through because um, unfortunately I think uh, you know right now we 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 lack a lot of that um, a lot of that control. 
Yeah, I think I think I think I think Pete, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm teaching at the at the university here in Luxembourg um, uh, about space and space entrepreneurship, and and the the case study, which is about um, Astroscale and and the tragedy of the commons, is the one that always incites the most heated and interesting debates. Um, because I mean, there's a reason why we call it a tragedy. It's just very very hard to protect commons. Right, and if you think about um, the analogous um, commons that we have on Earth, the ocean, which is governed by very, very similar laws as space, um, it is mostly a tragedy, right, and less so a commons. So we don't necessarily have a great history as humanity to come together and protect um, our environment for um, for future generations. I think space has one thing going for it, right. Um, the military really, really cares about it, right? And, and you know, the ocean, you know, the, the military cares about it, but it's just, it's just not as easily infringed upon what they want to do as it might be in space. And I think that gives me some hope that A, on one hand, we're gonna approach this from a, from a very rational perspective, which, you know, as a physicist, I feel like, unfortunately, you know, the movie Gravity and the kind of like the dereliction of every single laws of physics, you know, that happens in that movie has done more harm than, than actually benefit to the discussion about space debris. But my hope is that, you know, more rational and physics um, will actually infuse the discussion. And we do come up with, with laws that everyone adheres to and not just people like Pete or, or Spire, which I mean, we just, we literally like, our satellites disintegrate faster into their atoms than the paper bag you pick up in the supermarket. But I mean, there are other players that are either more powerful or countries that just don't necessarily adhere to that. But given that, you know, it is so relevant for the, for the military sector, I have some hope that we're gonna do better in space than we did so far on the oceans. And I think I think the the irony of this as well is is that um, you know the natural gut reaction is to just have stop, um, but actually I think the solution here is to to go forward, because um, you know a lot of the rationale for leaving junk in space is because it costs so much to get it there in the first place. Um, so if you've got a satellite um, and it costs a tremendous amount to get it there and operate it, then you, you know you don't want to carry extra propellant to do a deal but burn. Uh, but if Space access is incredibly cheap, um, and, and you know it's incredibly cheap to build that spacecraft. Then, um, and, and it's ubiquitous. Then uh, it's very easy to make that trade to put that propellant on board to actually do that deal, but burn, and and you know be a, a good a good steward. So I think it's it, it's kind of you know inversely to what you might think. It's actually we we we, we need to get over this hump, um, and I think uh, we 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 come to a better place. It's so great to hear the two leading space companies being so conscious and respectful of, of our space. And, and hopefully all, everyone playing up there will follow in, in these footsteps and ensure that we, we physically and, and with our spectrum stay separated and, and, and Leo and Geo or whatever orbit you're working in operational. Um, shifting gears a bit, but, but staying on, on this topic and, and, and Benny and Lori, um, we hear a lot from whether it's Pete launching the satellites or Peter satellites providing useful information to the world. How, how do your ventures help the current planet we live on? Looking now from space down to earth. Well, I'll start because we are the only nonprofit, non, non spec not raising money here, um, organization funded by philanthropy because of that unique perspective that space offers and all those things that David talked about that we can do in addition to imaging, imaging the earth from space, uh, contribute to modeling that helps us adapt um, to climate change and you know, reduce harm and suffering to humans. Um, more, I think, interesting is, a, again, he mentioned the ability to measure greenhouse gas emissions from space. And as that is becoming something sort of driven by the government, now commercial companies are doing it, we will be able to enforce international treaties, uh, do things like um, monetization schemes for, for carbon emissions, and that 
is a game changer for not just adapting, but mitigating. And what Earthrise does is work with um, both the companies that are creating this data, uh, as well as the governments who are setting policies based on the kind of capability we either have or will have to try and marry um, the technology. Because yeah, we are in a lot of trouble in my view uh, on this earth because of climate change and what our own uh, impacts to the earth have been. But we live at a time when we can do something about it. And that's uh, really exciting. So Earthrise is focused on bringing those technologies uh, to the government so they can have policies that will better utilize this unique vantage we have of the Earth from space. When, when, I, when I think about uh, Velo and 3D printing in space, uh, Laurie mentioned earlier in, um, how space has contributed immensely to uh, our current uh, progress in society that we have right now on Earth. In, 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 in the past decades. I think space is in a very pioneering position, again, when it comes to adoption of new technologies and push of new technologies for terrestrial benefits. So when you think about 3D printing and specifically manufacturing with metal 3D printing, space has been pioneering that. <clears throat> and, and, and specifically venture-backed space, like Rocket Lab, like SpaceX, uh, companies like that pushed uh, the envelope of what can be done with uh, with 3D printing. And we are seeing now a lot of companies in aviation and power generation and energy are using that as a, a, after they were inspired by what was what has been accomplished by, by, uh, by the space to uh, utilize that to make better products, products that are much more efficient, products that uh, are less uh, wasteful, that consume less materials, we see also the adoption of 3D printing for improving the manufacturing processes in semiconductor, pushing the computing uh, uh, innovation further than, than we could do before. So I think we, it's, an, it's a kind of a interesting that of all the technologies and of all the industries, space has been the pioneering industry that has been the first and the most avid adopter of 3D printing for the manufacturing of superior products. And, and we see we see this uh, now uh, becoming terrestrial in a very beautiful way. Nice. So now, in a fun twist, we're actually going to hand it over to our panelists to ask each other some questions. Um, so please specify one, maybe two, of, of one another uh, for your question. And if there are multiple, let's try to limit these to under a minute so we get through all of your questions. Um, David, can we start with you? Sure. Um, well, I guess if I, I have to just, I can't ask everybody uh, in the interest of time. So I'll ask Peter Beck and Benny Buller. Um, as you're looking at doing large financings, how are these going to facilitate or accelerate your mission? Could you go first? Oh, you're so kind, Benny. Uh, so for us, um, you know, m much like Peter Platzer, uh, we were already on a on a trajectory um, to a traditional IPO, and one of the one of the kind of the fundamental reasons for us to um, to go down this path was to get, have a public currency to do the kind of acquisitions that um, that we look to do. Uh, you know, we had a very successful acquisition uh, last year, and uh, we also missed out on one that we would really love to have done. So having that uh, having that ability to have that public currency um, is, is a real accelerant um, for us to achieve. You know, ultimately what we want to try here to, to achieve here is to build an end-to-end -end space systems company. I think everybody knows our launch vehicles very well, but um, you know we build a bunch of satellites too um, and and do other applications. So um, this, so this is this is really the accelerant. So it's, it's not absolutely not. No, having it's stock. not about the cash. Yeah, it's it's about having that currency. Uh, to to uh, you know to go and go and do the things we want to do. Yeah, for us it's also beyond the cash. So we need to scale up, and as we are growing very fast right now in in our sales, we need to grow our commercial operations. But it's it's really be, uh, the point is that for a lot of the our customers, what we offer is the possibility to design better products 
that would take advantage of the unique manufacturing capabilities that we provide. But if you think about this, there is fundamentally a tremendous amount of risk in that because we offer people to manufacture what was previously impossible, they could go out, again impossible. So the question is, are you going to be in business in a year or two? Is a question that we have been asked many, many times. So to, to be able uh, to show a transparent balance sheet, a company that is stable and that uh, people can know exactly what, where we are and where we are going, is tremendous in being able to open doors for us and to allow people to jump into these uh, capabilities. That, 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 that applies exactly the same for us as well, Benny, is especially when in the launch industry, uh, there's a lot of personalities that, and having, having a, a, a launch company um, that is, is exactly that transparent and, and, and very obvious in, in the direction it's going is soothing for a, a, number, of, um, a number of customers. Yeah. So Lori, what do you want to learn from the group? Okay. so. For me, you know, we've um, talked a lot about sort of the terrestrial markets and even the government beyond Leo and Geo markets. But I think, Peter, you went there um, as as I did that, you know, there's this unlimited um, potential. And <laughs> since uh, you just to put you on the spot again for for saying that recipes, by the way, my mom uses the internet for recipes, so it's not that stupid. But uh, the markets that you see for commercial space beyond Leo and Geo and beyond just selling to NASA or the government, that's what I'm interested in, in your view. Yeah, so I think, I think, I think you talked about this before, and this is that you know, we face what, what we inspire consider like the generational challenge, right, which is adapting to climate change. Right, you know, we missed we missed the train a long time ago to averting it, and now we have to adapt to it. Right, and I think the best way to do this is to have almost like a like a digital twin of planet Earth. Right, that really, you know, David talked about all the frequencies in which we can observe Earth and really understand what is happening there, um, uh, and then make a, a sustainable use of the resources that we have and adapt to the changes. Ever since I was a kid you know that 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 eternal question of like you know are we alone has uh, has really you know um uh, vexed me right and is one of the reasons why i've been ever so um excited about space because that's kind of like for me where the answer is right and so um you know maybe in particular to pete i mean you know we have like this this vision that you know you know two three billion years ago mars was like a, a green or at least a blue planet but that's actually not the only place where we can look for life and kind of like answer this question, at least in the sense of like, there is life in the, un in, in like the universe, at least in our solar system outside of planet earth. And I just, I just want to know like, you know, are, are we getting there? Are there ways how we can, you know, maybe look just beyond Mars? Are there maybe other ways than just relying only on our dear friends at NASA to answer this vexing and burning question for us? Peter, you only get one question. So is this your question to Pete? That is my question to Pete. Okay, well, Pete, well, you're on the hot seat. I, I, I think I think Peter Platts is uh, trying to vie for a seat on our science team on the Venus mission. That's what it sounds like to me. Always welcome, Pete. But um, so the, you know, the the yeah, I, I think that's a very important important question. And um, much like you, Peter, that that was that was the single thing that got me into space. I mean, I stood outside with my father looking at the stars, and he pointed out that those stars had planets, and there's probably somebody on one of those planets looking back at me and that that was that was really the point in time which is like oh this is okay this is this is a bit deep let's let, let's try and figure this one out so my entire life it's been you know uh if i ever have the opportunity to try and answer that question are we are we the only life in the universe i mean from a scientific standpoint in the absence of evidence you have to say currently we are although it's you know statistically probably unlikely but um until you prove otherwise then 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 that's kind of the fact so um, you know, I, I think you know David and Tess will will probably recall it well. In one one boardroom room meeting, I asked if I could have a rocket and a spacecraft and go and search for life in Venus. And uh, and it's it's not it's not your average kind of request, but um, in in true spirit of uh, of the board, um, they said sure. Um, little did they know that I've been working with the the phosphine science team in the background for some time, and uh, and we were planning and scheming this mission to take a sample of Venus's atmosphere to see 
if we can prove um, the existence of phosphine and, and or other elements or not. So you know th this this mission exists for us. Um, you know we're flying in 2023 and um, we're going well. We'll try and take a to that atmosphere and and I think um, you know Venus has long been hypothesised in in those clouds at that, that very sweet regime um, that there could be life and. Um, if you've, it would just be, if you've got the resources, it's rude not to give it a go, that's for sure. And what about Europa and Enceladus? There's a little bit far away for an electron and a photon to get. Um, the Venus, I think Venus though is, is the most underrated planet in our solar system. Um, I think if, if you're talking about climate change and kind of digital twins, well actually there's, there's a physical twin uh, to Earth just, just down the neighborhood. Uh, and you know it's it's a planet that that didn't get the love and it all turned to custard and that's what you get. So we you know we we should be reminded of that is our destiny uh, in, unless we make some changes. And I think we can learn a tremendous amount scientifically from from Venus. I think Mars gets all the the kind of headlines because um, you know Mars you, you know you you can put boots on the surface of Mars. That is a fact. Um, you're not going to put boots on the surface of Venus. So politically, it's not nearly as exciting. But I think from, from a scientific standpoint and actually from, uh, you know, from, from value to human, uh, human endeavor and human society, I think it's an it's extremely valuable um, resource and, and reserve for us to go and understand. Pete, hey, while the floor is yours, what is your question? Well, I mean, my, mine's a little bit more uh, SPACI related, and, and I guess you know this is one of the questions that I ask myself, um, and keen to ask you know throw it to the rest of the the um, the, the CEOs is, you know, how how do we educate the public markets um, about about new space? I mean, I think the public markets understand old space very well through the large defence contractors, uh, but new space is in a completely different um, regime. And you know, not not everything in new space, uh, you know, milestones are gated against necessarily just you know financial outcomes. There can, there can be a new development or engineering or scientific development in the business that 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 can mean an extraordinary uh, step forward. So you know, how do we? The question really is, is how do we educate the you know the public markets um, around new space and where where to look for uh, for value? Pete, the way I understood your question, you focus not on the not on the public audience, but on the public market. And the the way I uh, kind of look at that is, you're looking at uh, from a market perspective, it's a lumpy business with risks associated with that. And how do you uh, project growth and at the same time uh, can deliver with a lumpy market in the in the near term? And for me, one of the critical elements because uh, we have a similar type of market um, is uh, um, creating a set of indicators that are uh, in indicators of success in the future that you can execute on them um, and in, a, in a much shorter term and that are reducing the uncertainty as in the outcome in the financial outcome in future years so <clears throat> so and there are multiple indicators like that in our business and i'm sure there are multiple indicators like that in your business and and the question is how forthcoming you want to be with the public market sharing them given the competitive intelligence value of those indicators right and those are some of the dilemmas that we are dealing with ourselves right now so and benny what would you like to ask someone or yeah, I, I actually would have to ask a question to Pete here, which is we talked a lot about application and commercial applications and and about the, the uncertainty about which the application that will drive space, but the, the certainty that some of them would. I, I'll ask a slightly different question that if you had your choice, what would be your dream application that you would actually want to see materialize in the next decade in space? Is that for Pete or Peter? Pete. Yeah. Oh, is it tip for tat. Um, well, I mean, if I told you that, Benny, then then uh, then then everybody would know. So I, I'm not sure we can disclose too much of that. What is it like a there, birthday wish? You're not allowed no. to say. <laughs> well, um, maybe maybe I can help Pete out. Um, I can I can tell you I can tell you what I want. Right. Um, uh, I, um, I I was never interested in being an astronaut. Um, uh, that just really did not appeal to me. Like they slave away, they have a horrible schedule. They are like like stiffed away. It just it just so did not appeal right to here, me. Peter. 
You are one. I know, I, I, I know, I know. But this is this is special. This is different, right? Um, but I always was intrigued with kind of like um, uh, seeing an Earthrise out of my hotel window on the moon. Um, uh, and, and so for me, the uh, 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 the, the the use of, of moon as as a place to experience, you know, low gravity. Um, uh, a harvest, you know, helium three. You know, I, I did one. It's one of my thesis in, uh, in 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 fusion physics um, at the Max Planck Institute. So, you know, I think I think there's a, that's it. It's a it's a very very interesting application. Um, the opportunity to put the uh, observing capabilities into the universe on the dark side of the moon, away from all of the um, uh, pollution of Earth, um, and, and really just as a as a vacation space. You know, to just go there and experience a truly different environment. And walk on the moon. I think that would be my my wish for an application, uh, which is to have a, a permanent moon base and ability to go there, and hang out for a couple of days and see an Earth rise. And, Experience and, and, the overview effect for yourself. Exactly the right. Psychological exactly experience right. that astronauts come back to Earth with, where they don't see their city or their state or their country; they just see the Earth as one entity. Yeah. Exactly right. And to answer your question more directly, Benny, I, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we have the power to put a tremendous amount of, of, of sensor and, and analytics and, and um, you know, power in, in, in orbit to really understand the Earth. And I think, uh, I think that, that is one of our, our greatest, you know, greatest threats as we go forward is, is, is truly, you know, understanding how we, we adapt and, and, um, and, and take care of our planet. So um, I, I'm very fortunate to get to fly a lot of different payloads and see a lot of different customers um, and, and their business plans and, and, and their, 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 their company and vision statements. And, um, and you know, if, if you understand the, the kind of the plethora of sensors that are out there and what would happen if you deployed those at mass scale and then actually, you know, combine those together with, with artificial intelligence and supercomputing and you, you could, you could really understand the planet. It sort of goes to Peter Platz's point about a digital twin. Is you could really understand the planet in ways that um, that we in, you know we, we don't today. So um, you know we, we look forward to to the day where there's just many many more sensors uh, in orbit that, um, that that can really you know ultimately affect many more people down here on Earth. I'm most excited about the about the. Uh, cooperation now of private companies with government missions. Governments, of course, can bring resolve and funding to make, do these monolithic missions. But uh, but but the e but what we really need is an ecosystem, an ecosystem where we're all incrementally colonizing, learning, moving out from the planet, and each mission helps the next mission. I mean, we still don't understand the impacts of of uh, space on our health. Um, there's so we need. Like we're going to need to have fueling stations in space. All, there's going to have to be so many different companies who participate in all the aspects of space colonization in order for us to reach these dreams we have of, of either putting, learning about Venus or exploring Mars or, or Europa. Um, and, and governments can't do it alone and uh, startups can't do it alone, but together I, it's very exciting. Well, that is a great last way to conclude our SPACS, 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 SPACE SPACS panel. And we just really want to thank our panelists, Lori, Benny, David, Pete, Peter. Thank you guys. We all learned so much from you, from space junk to potential constellations of satellites to 3D printing on the moon to competing against billionaire funded space companies to aliens. I'll admit I wasn't expecting that one, Peter. And um, thank you to the audience. Thank you all for tuning in and asking such great questions to our speakers. We hope you found this conversation as interesting as I did. And we encourage all of you to please reach out if you're a space startup or found founder, we'd love to hear from you. So space at bvp.com goes to David and in my inbox. So uh, please reach out. Maybe you can share some feedback on our memos. That link was bvp.com slash memos. So thank you all again. And thank you, Tess and Nikki, for making this happen. Thank you so much. My pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, guys. Yes.